Hello, everyone. This is Alan Gilman with another uh, episode of Thinking Biblically. This is my revamped a podcast where I'm seeking to connect all of scripture to all of life, mainly doing it through uh, having conversations with interesting guests as we have one today. Um, but we're going to have to do some different things as we go along as well. Hope to have my son Daniel back with me in a, a few weeks. I know a lot of people enjoyed seeing him a couple of weeks ago, especially many of you who were part of my Old Testament survey course that uh, was completed uh, several weeks ago. And so I'm looking forward to having Daniel back. Last week, we had Dr. David Friedman, uh, an Israeli believer who helped us to some extent in the short time we have, understand what's going on with Israel in the Middle East. So if you uh, haven't yet checked that out, I encourage you to do so. And the best way to do this is remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel or subscribe to whatever podcast provider uh, you use. Uh, but remember on YouTube, when you hit subscribe, also don't forget to click the notification bell so that you will get those notifications. Well, today I am so happy to have Dr. Rod Wilson, who has worked many years in the field of psychology. From 2000 to 2015, Rod was president and professor of counseling and psychology at Regent College in Vancouver. He also has extensive experience as a pastor and international speaker, and a he's been a consultant to businesses and nonprofits, currently including, but not exclusively, AROCA Canada, a Christian environmental organization. I hope I pronounced that properly. Rod could uh, correct me in, in a moment, uh, but um, that could be a very interesting topic for, for some other time. Rod's also a senior writer with the Canadian Christian News and Comment magazine Faith Today, and he's the author of several books, including Keeping Faith in Fundraising. Some of you would be really interested in that. Others, not so much. Uh, he wrote that with Peter Harris, and two books on anger, both written with Glenn Taylor. Uh, they're entitled Helping Angry People, and exploring your anger, which is the subject that we'll be discussing today. Uh, but first, I this is a little bit of a disclaimer because I've known Rod for a very long time. And what's been happening, is, especially as I've been uh, connecting with some of my old friends, is when you start to think of how many years it's been. And so um, I was a student at Ontario Bible College in the latter half of the 70s. I graduated in 1981, along with my wife. That's another story. Um, and Rod was my counselor at that time. And he was such a big help and encouragement to me. But as I, that was, that, I probably met him, therefore, around 1978, right? Right, Rod? 1978. Yeah. It'd be which, when it was. Which makes us both very old, Alan. Well, we're not talking about we're not talking about that today. So we're going to continue. Okay. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's just I I just wonder where the years go when when we start to think. But I remember um, I went to this Bible study um, at the Scott Mission in Toronto, which is a, a pretty famous inner city mission, and um, I was doing a Bible study with two or three at that time elderly men, much elder than me, probably in their 80s. And they were telling stories as if that happened yesterday until I finally realized they were talking about things that happened like in the early 1900s. And it's just, I've now learned, you know, you know, memory is this like, you've got this instantaneous connection to the past. Um, and it, it is really, really something. And so, you know, speaking of the past, before we continue and get into the subject at hand, um, I want to share with everyone my two Rod Wilson gems that I've been carrying around in my metaphorical pocket. One of them all the way back to the 70s and another one that was more recent. The first one is um, the difference between, do you know what I'm gonna say? I don't. Yeah, the difference between a reason and an excuse. Yes. Yeah. And somehow we were talking and maybe I was uh, getting them confused. That would be a good opportunity to do that. And uh, I remember, the, I don't know if it's your illustration or if it's mine, uh, you go through a stop sign and the policeman stops you and um, starts to inquire about what happened, about going through the stop sign. And the person says, um, I didn't see it. And so you explained that's a reason, but it's not an excuse and how important it is to differentiate those two. So I have... I can't say I've always been good at being true to that gem, but I've certainly, I've carried it with me and I've passed it on to others. Uh, the other one um, you gave me, and there's been other ones 
uh, and I guess I lost a bunch of them, but these two I have not lost. And this one you shared with me over one of our breakfasts in more recent history at, at a white spot in Vancouver. And it and you said, don't confuse differences with um, differences with neurosis. That also sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you yeah. know, do you remember what the illustration was? Boy, this is turning out to be a memory test here. I thought I was talking about anger. Well, I'm trying to get you riled up. <laughs> okay. And I, in fact, when I bring this illustration up that you used to explain to me how we shouldn't make differences, uh, that uh, difference between other people into a neurosis as if they're having a neurosis instead of simply a difference, you brought up scrambled My wife. eggs. Scrambled oh, yes. eggs. <laughs> yes. Oh, you want it? Oh, we could talk about your wife if you want to. No, let's, let's scrambled eggs and i love ketchup with scrambled eggs and by the way if you love ketchup with scrambled eggs why don't you put something in the chat or the comment because i think i might need support here but you i think you have a bit of a problem with it don't you what, what's your problem with scrambled eggs and ketchup rod it makes me angry <laughs> does it really <laughs> It does. Yeah, I don't like ketchup belongs on hot dogs and hamburgers and French fries, not on eggs. And the color contrast, the red and the yellow is just too overwhelming for me. Yeah, but I like it. I I, I like that combination. I'm a little colorblind. I don't know if you've ever taken the colorblind test. I am slightly colorblind. Maybe there's just something that appeals to me with that particular contrast. It has a lot to do with the taste. And I think my mother gave it to me at a very early age. Okay. Would that have something yeah. to do with it too? Yeah, that could be a reason, but it's not an excuse. <laughs> and so the thing is, it is such a good lesson because we, this is what we do. And, and, and it, I imagine it will come up as we talk about anger. It's just so easy when we see that somebody's different to turn that into as if there's something wrong with them. And so much, can we say so much of the world, world's problems is just that. Yeah. And especially in our polarized day that we're in right now with all the finger pointing and all the shouting is people are losing the ability to appreciate difference. It's like you just have to take sides on everything. Yeah, yeah, no, very true, yeah. Well, so let's get into the topic at hand. And uh, I've entitled this anger, uh, the most misunderstood emotion. Would you agree with that? Because I know other people, I, I, some other people, some people think it's grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I th- well, first of all, Alan, I'm thrilled to be on with you. Have very powerful and affectionate memories of you and Robin back in the day and more recent years as well. So thank you for having me on. It's lovely to, to be with you. And uh, hopefully our conversation will be edifying for those who are listening and helpful for them. Um, yeah, I would... I would agree it is one of the most misunderstood emotions. I think there's probably a number of reasons for that. I think one of them is a lot of us see it as a negative emotion. So we have this feeling that like if I'm joyful or I'm surprised or I'm happy or I have love, those are positive things. And then if there's anger, it's a negative. So I think we don't we don't understand anger as something that can be positive or can be negative. I think that's one part of the misunderstanding. I think Christians have huge misunderstanding about anger, largely because of a lack of understanding of the biblical material. Um, I think we have this notion that being angry is wrong or it's sinful, so therefore it's misunderstood. And if any of our viewers today come out of a, you know, to some degree a Middle East background or an Asian background, and they've lived in a shame-based culture, um, often uh, people experience anger and shame. So if I express anger in China, that's shameful. And if I express anger to you, you may lose face. So then if I'm Asian, how do I express my anger to you if I know I'm gonna lose face and you're gonna lose face? So I think all of that makes it misunderstood for a lot of people. And then the other piece of it, it's the most engaged emotion physically. It's actually interesting, one of the Hebrew words in the Old Testament for anger is kind of a a snorting or blowing through the nose. Um, It's a very physical response. So when we're angry, a lot of our body is engaged. And that's, sometimes we're a bit confused by that. It's like you had three cups of coffee 
and you're so vigilant and and so aroused by your anger, it's it's misunderstood. So I think you're right. I think there's a whole lot of reasons why it's a misunderstood emotion. Yeah, I don't know if we'll have time. I'm fascinated by the physicality thing, and a lot of in a lot of spiritual traditions, there's such a um, call it fear. Another great emotion. Um, a we basically don't know what to do with things physical. So the more, and and in a lot of Christian tradition, there's such, my experience has been, there's such a disconnection between what we think is a healthy spiritual state and anything that is more physical. Now, of course, in some circles, you know, there's exuberant worship and celebration, but in others, uh, it's all about being calm and almost, you know, and sedate, that that's more spiritual than somebody yeah. that, experiencing um, ex any kind of excitability. Yeah. But, but maybe this would be a good time to ask the, the other question, which is, what is anger? Yeah, yeah. So to help us understand, <laughs> to understand, yeah. we know what it is. Well, I think there's a couple of aspects to defining anger. I think, first of all, it is an emotional experience, so we know that. Uh, it usually comes from something blocking or thwarting or getting in the way of what we want, uh, what we desire, what we hope for. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you're driving, you're late for an appointment and it's rush hour, the ultimate contradiction, rush hour. It's really slow and the traffic's slow and you're really frustrated with all these strangers. Why are you frustrated? Because your goal is you want to get to your appointment on time and Something's getting in the way of you getting there. So I think anger is simply an expectation that's been blocked. We tend to get angry when something that we want or desire or wish for gets blocked, and then that creates frustration for us. So, you know, your funny example of ketchup on eggs, like when I see Bev pour her ketchup on her scrambled eggs, I don't get angry, but I get irritated because I just think it's wrong. I mean, anyone who knows how to eat would not eat that way. So I have a view of what eating properly means, and if she's going to put ketchup on eggs, that, that blocks my expectation. Well, could you explain how that is similar to the frustration we feel in a traffic jam? Because the well, emotion is, you're saying the emotion is similar, but yeah. maybe I'm slow. I don't really get that connection. Like there's irritation, yeah. or maybe that's, maybe I just answered the question. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the issues with anger is we have a lot of different terms. You know, I'm ticked off, I'm peeved, I'm irritated, I'm exasperated, I'm in a rage. Like, it's quite a big continuum. And, you know, I mean, we're using this illustration humorously today. But when I look at Bev put ketchup on eggs, it's sort of irritating. And we laugh about it because I expect her to eat properly. Uh, when I'm in the car wanting to go to an appointment, I expect to get there on time. And so the traffic's getting in the way. Uh, Bev's not eating properly. That's getting in the way of my expectations. So interestingly, one of the ways to deal with anger is not to look out at what's creating it, but to look in at what your expectation is. Because sometimes you have expectations that aren't realistic or appropriate. Okay, so, so far the two illustrations um, do sound negative. In the sense that, and I, I assume, um, you know, acting out of one's anger, frustration in traffic can be destructive. Yep. And, it, and we know one of the ways it can be destructive is how we start to spout out when we have other people in the car and all the things that they're hearing. And next thing you know, the parents are arguing yep. about something else and it just goes, it's, it snowballs. Yep. Then, you, I don't know, we probably need a separate talk about you and Bev and the eggs and the ketchup. But it, it does illustrate these differences between close people, they could be friends, that, you know, parents and kids and, and spouses, about some of these differences and how that can irk them yep. and how to work that out. Yep. But these still sound like it would be better if we would put up with the traffic jam, put up with the, the eating differences. Yep. So could you give an example of positive anger? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, let's go to Mark chapter 3. Um, so a man with a shriveled hand comes to Jesus, and Jesus gonna, is going to heal him. And the people looking on, my translation, say, do you know what day it is? <laughs> it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. 
And Mark 3 and 5 says, Jesus looked at them in anger, deeply distressed at the stubbornness of their hearts. And so in the face of, you know, people who he expected would know more, would understand the sacred text better, would capture the spirit of the text about Sabbath, he sees them being stubborn. And it's so interesting in Mark 3, it's not even what he says. The biblical text says he looked at them in anger deeply distressed at the stubbornness of their heart. So sometimes when people are stubborn around us, and in that context, stubborn with biblical truth and not capturing the big picture, anger is appropriate. Um, and I think, you know, to me, the key template in this, Alan, that I would, I would use to sort of unpack a lot of the biblical material is the Ephesians 4, 26, 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down where you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. And I think in that, in those two verses, we really have what I think is the t- biblical template where the first phrase, in your anger, do not sin, implies that you can be angry and sin, or you can be angry and not sin. Um, or to use language used earlier, you can be angry and it's negative, or you can be angry and it's positive. And the, it's interesting, the Greek word that's used there is orge, in your orge anger, do not sin. And this is kind of a settled displeasure. You know, you, you're, you're watching TV and somebody is drunk and, and killed somebody as a result of driving while, while drunk. And you're just mad. You think this is terrible. Like this is awful. Like some of the things that are going on in the world make me mad. That's anger that's not sinful. But if it becomes personal animosity and if it becomes vengeance, that's when it becomes sinful. So if I go to that guy while he's being taken to the jail and I shoot him because he killed somebody because while well, he was drunk, that's personal animosity and vengeance, which is taking anger in a negative way. So I think even as a parent, often we're frustrated with our children or we're angry with our children. That's appropriate as long as it doesn't move into personal animosity and vengeance. And it's interesting in Ephesians 4, this orge word, uh, Paul actually in Ephesians 4.31 says, get rid of all uh, bitterness, rage, and anger. That's the orge word. So he's saying, if you're going into personal animosity, you're going into vengeance, you need to get rid of that. But being angry at something that's appropriate to be angry with, that's all right. And it's not sinful and it can be positive. So I'm going to I'm gonna press you on, can you, uh, more examples of, of positive, po, po, we'll call it positive anger for now, I guess. Yep. Whether yep. biblical or experiential, I, I, I have the impression that, f- most people couldn't give those examples. Well, let's go to Nehemiah uh, chapter 5, where Nehemiah is angry at the social injustice that he sees going on amongst God's people. There's an example where the inequity uh, that happens in that context of Nehemiah in chapter 5, Nehemiah is angry about that. So to be angry about injustice, that's appropriate. To be angry about drunk driving, you know, mad, interesting acronym, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, that's a movement that started with anger at its core. And when we see people abused, when we see what's going on in various parts of the world, to have a response of anger towards that is an appropriate response, as long as it's not personal animosity, as long as it's not vengeance. Because this is how God responded. God uh, also gets angry. Jesus got angry. And as those created in God's image and as followers of Jesus, passivity is not the goal, it's actually engagement. Um, So something like social injustice in Nehemiah 5 would be a good example or what Jesus did. I mean, you're involved in leadership and ministry. Sometimes you you watch what other people are doing and the stubbornness they have, it makes you frustrated. And I think that is appropriate. Do you have any other stories of of how you've seen uh, anger result in in constructive activity because i think one of the things in our society today is doing something over an injustice has become taking it to the streets and protesting or and i'm not saying all protests are are wrong i think there's a time for groups to get out there and make their voices heard in that public sort of way but there's all this blasting and shaming over social media 
Um, but do you have any stories of people you know that have started with anger and then did real good with it? Well, I think a lot of the, I mean, it's interesting to me in the current culture that a lot of the social injustice that we're seeing, for example, the, the uh, COVID vaccination, um, you know, now the data would suggest that the, two, the two-thirds world countries are not getting the vaccine at the same level as the one-third world countries. And there's an inequity about that. And so a number of people around the world have seen that and have actually created that, that body that allocates vaccines in a different way so it doesn't become an economic inequality expression. So in that sense, it can, can be uh, starting with looking at something very negative but actually it facilitates growth at the other end. Um, I think with our children and in positions of leadership, if I'm a leader or I have a position of, of authority, if I never express irritation, if I never express uh, anger in my position of authority, I'm not actually drawing out in a, in, a, in a positive way what other people can do. So often, when we're in leadership roles, when we're in parental roles, our frustration, our healthy expression of anger can actually mature and help grow the other person. Uh, they don't always like it, but it can certainly help that way as well. And in the school system, it's the same thing. If there's no expression of irritation, no expression of anger, students aren't going to mature and learn in the same way. Can you expand on that one? Well, let's say we go into a permissive everything that you do uh, in a school, uh, every, everything you're involved in in the school environment, nobody expresses any frustration, nobody expresses any anger, you're kind of allowed to do what you want to do, then there's no consequences. There's no things that are brought to the table. Um, I remember when my daughter was two and she ran out in the street, I got angry and express that anger to her. And part of that anger was her having to learn that you don't run out in the street when you're two years old. But if I just went, oh, you know, she's running out in the street, I really love her, and there's no negative expression, then that's not going to, that's not going to change at all. You mean you're not supposed to pick her up and say, boy, you're such a fast runner, but run over here. Because isn't that what people are taught today? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, always affirm, always affirm. Now, I, yeah. I got to be careful because I was raised in a family where anger flew left, right, and center. It yeah. was a it was a default setting, and we'll, we'll in a moment we'll get to destructive anger and what to, what to do about it. But um, and so anyway, being raised in a fiery kind of family environment, and and, and much of the relatives, there was the odd, more passive person in the in the wider clan and friends of my of my parents, this sort of thing. But by and large, uh, and not all Jewish people are like that. But in our um, you know Eastern European rooted Jewish culture, there was a lot of passion. Yeah. Um, but it seems in some other cultures being more passive and, and holding back was just seen as to be the the higher value have, have you yeah. ever uh you don't mention names of course but in your counseling practice have you ever tried to get the person to get angry well i think you know there's some interesting psychological research on this because anger is energy there's a lot of anger and energy one of the things that happens is somebody never gets frustrated never gets angry, never gets irritated, and they keep pushing it in, often one of the byproducts of that is depression or passivity. So uh, I've been involved in lots of abusive situations where spousal abuse or parental abuse or different kinds of abuse, and the person being abused experiences no anger. They just kind of let it keep coming, they let it keep coming, but it's when they become aware of their anger and they realize I expect to be treated better than this. I don't expect to be hit by my spouse, I expect to be hit by you know, my boss or whatever it is. Um, when the anger comes up, then they actually can move towards more health. And some of our viewers that have been sexually abused, part of their healing process has been to go from passivity, where it doesn't seem to affect them at all, to actually an awareness of anger that this makes me mad that I've been sexually abused over many years. And through that process, the healing comes. 
but just to always push it down can be very unhealthy. So cultivating it and bringing it up. And, and the Proverbs is rich in this. If you read through the Proverbs on anger and ask the Proverbs the question, is anger wrong? Is anger inappropriate? The Proverbs would say, it's how you manage the anger. It's how you deal with the anger that's the key thing. It's not the presence or absence of it. It's how you deal with it. Um, but absolutely, I think in many pastoral situations, people do need to get more angry to deal with things redemptively. Right. So another time we'll have to talk about how we talk to the books of the Bible. Like I didn't know about this asking Proverbs questions, but we'll deal with that yeah. some other time. Um, I think for a lot of people, one of the reasons why they're afraid of anger is what's been modeled for them is the default setting being to stuff or keep control on the anger and then exp eventually explode. And yeah. so ev every, just about every expression of anger is a destru is the destructive version of it. Yeah. So then we're, we're back to like, and interesting, I think I caught that you said the people who are not aware of their, if people are not aware of their anger, that must mean they have it. It's not like they don't have it. Would you agree? Well, I would go back. I mean, this for me would be a theological issue that I think because we're created in the image of God, I mean, in, throughout the centuries, there's been many sort of explanations as to what that means. But I think one of the things it means, amongst many others, is being created in the image of God means that we have the capacity to experience things that God experienced. So God has a cognitive thinking function. He has a volitional willing function. He has an emotive uh, feeling function. Like that's part of who God's character is. When you read through the text of scripture, you get the sense that God thinks and feels and decides. Like that's the nature of him. Us being created in that in his image, we have that as, as well. We have that capacity to do it. So if we never- Can I just stop you there for a second? Are you aware yeah. of the doctrine of the immutability of God? Mm -hmm. And how some yeah. as scholars historically have taught that God actually doesn't have any emotions, that these are anthropomorphisms um, in the scripture yeah. meaning. This is just a way to describe something about God that we can understand, but in his godness, he doesn't have any emotions at all. It's, it's a bit of a tangent, but because you've tied our emotions to God's image, if we don't understand that God himself truly gets angry, and happy and joyful and all the rest. If we don't understand that, that we're gonna have difficulty applying to ourselves, which leads us again to what I said earlier about this idea of, of true spirituality is this very kind of staid, solemn, non, non-affected, I might be the technical way to describe it. Yep. And the thing about if I understand properly, the this idea of the immutability of God is that he's unaffected. Do you yep. wanna go down this? this tangent a little bit? Well, where I would go with this um, is I would go to Genesis 6. So God does this reflection on all that's happened with what he's created. And the Genesis 6 passage describes that he was grieved. His heart was filled with pain. He brought the flood, destroyed a lot, it was a it was a redemptive act as well it wasn't all destruction it was redemptive but if you read that genesis 6 passage there's a lot of emotion in that passage grief filled with pain uh, some translations actually use the word regret which raises all kinds of theological issues um god was very upset in genesis 6 with the state of his creation and he obliterated a lot of it uh as a result of that so and then when I come to Revelation, um, you know, 14 and 10, if anyone worships the beast, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. And that fury word is thumos, uh, sort of the rage kind of anger. Um, you can make the anthropomorphic argument and say, well, you know, that's just how we understand it. But that's pretty powerful language. I mean, it's, it's a bit like the Psalm 2 and 12, kiss the sun in case he's angry and you be destroyed in your way. I mean, that's... Whether we want to say that's anthropomorphizing or not, it's pretty strong emotive language. Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a hundred percent with you. I think that understanding of God being uh, unaffected by things in the and it's in the name of God can't change, and they define so any kind of change on God's part 
it's 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 not i don't think it's biblical at all i think it's based on other kinds of philosophy and i think it's yeah. done us you know the big us a, a lot yeah. of damage in fact so i totally agree with you that our emotions are a reflection of god's emotions which brings yeah. us back now I, I think we have to be careful that, you know uh that you know we don't have the the right to rage like god does and when yeah. he rages he does it within the parameters of true righteousness and justice yep. when we rage we become unglued which takes yep. us back again to the destructive um i don't know if we spent enough time on, on the constructive um definitely uh the the destructive kind needs to be addressed um but i am wondering how much is not being done in the world because people who are burdened with a true injustice are not coming up to the plate to actually do something constructive and creative because it's something that is bothering them. And I'm particularly concerned for men. Um, I have, I, I believe there's a lot more men that kind of see some of this, some of the bigger picture issues of life and they've never given themselves, nobody's given them permission to begin to constructively express uh, this need for change that maybe they could help bring about. Yeah. Did you, do you agree with that? I do. And I think you said something earlier, Alan, that I want to go back to, because I think, you know, a lot of us have learned what we've learned through modeling, not through teaching. And right. I think modeling is a much, you know, an incarnational modeling is much more powerful than being told. Can you explain so, that? That's for some people that they may not get what that means, incarnational model. Okay, so what I'm saying is my lived experience, like I didn't, but let's say I grew up with a father that was angry all the time, losing his temper all the time, really mad all the time. Um, and then somebody comes and teaches me and says, well, that's only one form of biblical anger. There's other forms of biblical anger. I'm going to be more impacted by my father than by that one sermon because I've lived all anger is rage, all anger is abuse of all anger is negative. That's what I've lived. That's been embodied for me. That's what I've learned. Um, it's interesting. There, there's a number of Greek words, and they're parallel in the Old Testament Hebrew, but there's three Greek words that are really important on this for me. One is the orge word, which I talked about, in your anger, do not sin. So that, you know, me looking at TV, little babies killed by a drunk driver, it make, I say to Bev, that makes me mad. That's orge anger. The second one is parogismos, which is irritation and exasperation. And that's the rest of that Ephesians 4 passage. In your anger, in your orge, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down where you are still angry. That's parogismos. So when you're irritated, when you're exasperated, don't cultivate that. Use that positively. But then the third Greek word it's used is thumos, which is rage or temper. And all through the scripture, that always is a sin for people, and obviously never a sin for God. But thumos is used to describe God's anger. And I think, to, if I can speak Greek for a moment, I think what happens is most of us have seen a lot of thumos, so we have no clue how to do orge. We've seen this rage, and we think, oh, if I get angry, I'm going to get into a rage, I'm going to lose my temper, it'll be sinful. You're right, it will. But there's other ways to express anger that are quieter, that are calmer, and that are actually moving us towards something that's positive. It's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians about godly sorrow. Like there's worldly sorrow where nothing happens. And then there's godly sorrow, which is, I think, what Jesus experienced in Mark chapter 4, or Mark chapter 3, rather. That, that sense of, man, I get so frustrated with these religious leaders that don't get the whole counsel of God and nitpick about what day it is. Uh, he's mad, but so that's moving him towards yeah. ministry. So there's one thing, I've actually thought about this a lot since talking to you about this topic years ago, reading your book, um, and there's the whole concept of, of constructive anger, and I have a theory that I want to bounce off you, you can tell me if it's sound, yeah. um, that whatever this is that is called anger, this particular emotion that isn't sadness and, and isn't, isn't, you know, happiness and, and grief and so on, um, if we if we properly and more immediately constructively respond to anger it's is it possible we don't even know that it's anger um so we see a slightly different way maybe but it's that it's that it's that 
um, I don't want to call it necessarily compulsion, but that that if you know some people are more ready to see a problem and deal with the problem. And I know, of course, you have a job that's all dealing with problems. You just you just deal with them, but not that kind, not not the the run of the mill kind. But then there's something wrong, and so there's something in us that sparks that physicality that we talked about at the beginning that gets yeah. us up off the chair and do something about it. Yeah, yeah. And I I think a lot of the unhealthy kind is when we sit there and we fume, and sometimes it's because we don't know what to do. Or, or we're thinking somebody else has to do it and they're not doing it and, and and we don't want to confront them and so then we get more and more frustrated and and irritated and that sort of thing as opposed to moving more quickly to some constructive either a plan or action yeah no and i think um to me that's a beautiful summary of i think the second phrase in ephesians 4 26 in your orge do not sin do not let the sun go down while you were still paragismos, while you were still irritated. And I don't, you know, when Bev and I got married, I used to think that meant if we're having a conflict at night, we should stay up till two in the morning and resolve it because, you know, the sun, and I'd forgotten the sun went down about six hours ago, you know, so that's not- It's another first. gem, folks. That's another Rod Wilson gem. I should have mentioned <laughs> that one because I was thinking about it while you were talking. Continue. Yeah. But I think what the passage means, it's like that Old Testament construct of paying wages every day, like there's closure, right? You work a day, you get paid. You work another day, you get paid. Irritation and exasperation that's cultivated over time. Lots of suns are going down. Lots of days are being completed. And you're just, you're in your, your mess and you're in your irritation, you're in your exasperation. It doesn't go anywhere. It's not facilitating kingdom work. You're just kind of in a mess. And if I can say it, a lot of older men are grumpy and cynical and sarcastic because I think they have done exactly what you've described. They've let their paragismos go down or not, not get resolved and move towards kingdom values, but have actually been cultivated over many years. And now they're just grumpy and cynical and sarcastic. And they're not moving towards ministry. They're not moving towards a loving act uh, and serving Jesus that way. They're, they're just all preoccupied with their irritation and exasperation. Yeah. Also, um, I've, it's, it's, it's a sad kind of chuckle, but that verse about don't let the sun go down your anger. I don't know how many of us turn that into a, uh, don't go to bed angry. It says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So do it while it's still daytime. And on top of that, in that part of the world, the sun goes down at six o'clock in the evening. Yeah. This is yeah. not Edmonton, Canada, where it, at, yeah. like at today, you know, we're in, in June, it's going to go down at 11 o'clock at night. So, yeah. you know, deal with your stuff at, at, a, at a good time. You know, don't, don't let it go and especially don't let it fester over, you yeah. know, longer periods of time, like you're saying. Um, yeah. I want to make sure before we, we go that we deal with destructive anger and yeah. um because we don't have an unlimited time i'm especially concerned like when we hear about this there there are people um they've got their own anger issues some of them maybe this is going to help them that some of the things that are bothering them we want to encourage them go do something constructive about it don't just sit there and let it fester but yeah. then there are people in all sorts of relationships and it's it whether it, it could be in organizations with, with your boss with with co-workers with spouses and so on parents what would you advise people that are witnessing destructive anger uh, from people that are close to them yeah yeah well a couple of things i I would want to build the foundation of my answer on verse 27 of, of Ephesians 4, do not give the devil a foothold. And I think that verse actually is the summary of what Paul has said about anger. And what he's implying there, and this certainly mirrors my own experience, is if we don't deal with our anger well, we're giving, we're giving the devil a foothold. So I, I would put this in the category of principalities and powers, spiritual battle, prayer, um, you know, the tension of living righteously with a temptation to sin. And if we don't handle anger well, then one of the things we're doing is we're giving the devil a foothold. And it's interesting that giving the devil a foothold has often been, you know, ripped out of its context and applied to all sorts of things. 
but actually in the biblical text that applies to anger. So that would be my first comment. Recognize this isn't some neat social science psychology thing. This is actually a principalities and powers, the potential of giving the devil a foothold. So that'd be number one. Number two, we need to recognize that there are times when other people are doing things that are creating anger in us. So Ephesians 6 and 4, fathers, parents, do not exasperate your children. Uh, that word is paragismos. Don't, in a position of authority where you're a, you're a parent and you've got children, you could create anger in your children by excessive confinement. You know, we know in the New Testament time, children were not prized the way they should be. Um, in a position of leadership, in a marriage, sometimes other people are creating anger in us. And it's interesting, the biblical text is not, you have a problem with your anger. The biblical text says, the people who are making you exasperated, they need to deal with that. Uh, so I've seen lots of abuse of marriages, for example, where a spouse is really hurt and really grieved and really angry at the, what the abusive spouse is doing and feels guilty because they're feeling that. Well, actually, the biblical text says this person has the problem. They're creating the irritation and the exasperation. So we need to be careful not to assume every time we feel anger or feel exasperation, it's wrong. It may be an abusive relationship. I've been in workplaces, as I'm sure you have, where I've had bosses and authorities over me that have made me very angry. And then I think, oh, I shouldn't be angry. But what they're doing is making me angry, right? It's not just all my problem. Uh, so I think- Okay, just to be clear, just to be clear, and that there's, I don't know if it's just me, but I also wanna make sure for the people that are listening uh, to the audio version about who's who here. And so um, I asked about de um, dealing with people who are exhibiting uh, destructive anger. Yep. But now we're talking about, you started with the person who's feeling angry yep. due to the actions of somebody else. Yep. Okay, so let's say I have an angry boss. No, no, no. Yep. I have an abusive boss yeah. and I'm feeling angry. Yeah. So this is the person that we, if we're counseling them, we have to encourage them how to do constructive things with their anger. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. Um, yeah. And one of the things is to help them understand that their anger is not their fault. It is yeah. the normal reaction to this kind of oppression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, then there is the person who deals with their stuff in all sorts of unhealthy, angry ways. Yep. What do you tell the person who is suffering from that, that you know, displays of anger? And yep. in some households, uh, sometimes that anger isn't necessarily directed at individuals. There are people that, that just, they're angry. And it's, it's like there's this cloud of anger that surrounds them. And then they expect other people to just kind of live with that. Is there anything yeah. you would say to the person witnessing unhealthy anger? How are they supposed to respond? Yeah. Well, this is where I would root um, a lot of my response to this in the wisdom literature and particularly in the Proverbs. I mean, it's interesting in Proverbs 22, 24, make no friends with those given anger. Do not associate with hotheads or you may learn their ways and entangle yourselves in a snare. So I think there are places, and I would advise this in relationships, in marriages, and families, and workplaces, there is time to withdraw. Like if somebody's got unbridled anger that's unstewarded and unattended, I think there are times to withdraw for a period so that person can actually deal with their core issues and their core problems. So I think in some marital situations and some family situations and some work situations, a withdrawal from the anger person for a period of time, not permanent, because we all need to be working towards redemption, which allows them to get the help they need. Now, some situations that doesn't happen. The person doesn't get the help they need. But I think we need to recognize that people need to deal with it by separating themselves at times uh, when they're in that very abusive situation. Because I don't think it's, I mean, the proverb is very clear, uh, associating with a hothead is gonna create a lot of problems for you as well as for them. Yeah, and, and so there are a lot of people that are in situations where they have a relationship 
to such a person yep. and not everyone can easily get out but we should encourage them to get, get help to begin to get that distance and deal with it if yep. you got hold of the hothead what would you what would you where would you start them off and maybe they're not maybe they're not a believer maybe they don't uh hold to a, a biblical you know at a yeah. world view at all yeah what would you what would you start them off with well i think the um the little template that i find helpful in this is to distinguish between confessing and expressing I think somebody who's got a lot of anger and they're always expressing it and they're always, you know, letting it fly and it's very abusive and it's really hurting other people. Part of the move towards health is to go to a pastor, to go to a counselor, a therapist, whatever it is, and start confessing the anger. Like you're not moving into the counseling office and expressing all your anger, but you're you're saying, I'm expressing anger in a very unhealthy way in a lot of my relationships. I'm here now to confess that this is a problem that I need to deal with and I need to understand. Yep, and and right. when we move from expression to confession, I think it allows us to look at it, to say, it's not like I am an angry person, but I'm a person who has a problem with anger and I need to look at what's the source of that. What's that about? What have I nurtured over time? And sometimes it's woundedness in history. Sometimes it's a feeling of insecurity. Uh, sometimes it's a feeling of being out of control. There's all kinds of reasons why people can feel it. So I think that's one thing. Um, and then I think the other one is that we don't repress or suppress the anger. Because if we repress or suppress the anger, repress is, um, you know, sort of an unconscious process. Uh, suppress is an intentional process. It's going to come out somewhere else. I mean, if I'm a really angry person, I'm constantly pushing it down it'll show up in various places. So I need to be careful to go somewhere where it's safe and say, I have a problem with anger, I need to talk to you about this. And then we go back and forth and talk about it, try to understand it. Because the hardest thing with anger, Alan, I think, is most of us want to blame circumstances or people for our anger. Uh, we don't want to own it. We don't want to say, this is my problem and I need to deal with it. We say, well, if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't have got so mad. Well, what you're saying is you change your behavior and then I'll stop being angry. Yeah. And I, I think also we could say to angry people that there is an appropriate um, forum for them to express whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. And maybe there were injustices done. And of course, there's always misunderstandings. And yeah. wouldn't it be wonderful to provide for people a safe environment to get in touch with their anger to ex and to express that anger um and you never know what they might we might find that's positive lock deep down and also exactly. I, you probably would agree there's a lot of very angry people who don't exhibit classic anger there there's no exactly. rage they're just very bottled up yeah. and it sometimes it takes a a a, a, a wise person to even see that it's anger that it's yeah. that's actually boiling with it inside them and i think a lot of people are terrified to let that out but yeah. you know we're so grateful that we serve a god and know a god who can help us get in touch with the messiest of our stuff and yeah. find freedom and help and start to build a cons more constructive and effective life and you know um I'm, I'm really grateful you've been referring to scripture all the way through. This is supposed to be the Thinking Biblically podcast, and you've yeah. been helping people to think biblically. And um, and implicitly, you've been showing that we can go to the scriptures for uh, issues like this and get the real help that we need. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is where, I mean, it's one of the reasons I did so much work in anger a number of years ago is because my fear is that a lot of Christians have picked up sort of socio-cultural messages of what it means to be Christian that are not in step with scripture. And so, you know, it's kind of the Mother Teresa thing. Like people look and think, oh, Mother Teresa, she's so calm and quiet and never gets angry. Well, now we found out after her death that she had lots of struggles and lots of things she was frustrated with in her relationship with God. And people are like, I don't know what to do with that. I thought Mother Teresa was the, the quintessential person that, you know, never got upset, never got angry, never was grieved, never struggled with her relationship with God. But she did. 
Um, so I think the scripture is really amazing in its recognition of who we are as people created in the image of God, but that it's not as simple, like, does the Bible say, you know, it's sinful to be angry? No, actually, it doesn't say that. Does the Bible say it's not sinful to be angry? No, actually, it doesn't say that either. We've got to push into it more. Um, and I, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, the Jesus with the money changers in Matthew, Mark, and John. Uh, people love that passage, you know, and people say to me, well, Jesus got really angry in the temple. And I said, well, t paint the picture for me. What do you think happened in the temple? Well, and, and then what they tell me is how they deal with anger, right? They, well, he probably got all red in the face and he was yelling and bouncing off the walls. And then more serene people say, well, he probably went in and he took the table and he just kind of tipped it over a little bit. And, but the interesting thing That's is great. in those three stories in Matthew, Mark, and John, it never says he was angry. Never says it. Um, so we're left to see Jesus Physically, this is back to the physicality thing you mentioned earlier. Jesus physically expressing his view of in social injustice and economic injustice, which is, I think, what that passage is about. But it never describes him as being angry. He expressed it physically, like looking in Mark 3, you know, or Mark 4, looking at them in anger with his face. So, yeah, I'm with you. I think, you know, let's social sciences have their place. Psychology has its place. Counseling has its place. But let's be biblically literate and not let social sciences take over for us. Well, that's that's great from a a um, trained psychologist like yourself. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I think we do want. So one of the things here is that whoever is watching this or listening to this, there's been a lot of reference to, to, to the Bible. And this might be new to you, but I'm sure Rod would agree that there is help from God for you, whatever your struggles might be. And, and, and today we're talking about anger and, and specifically, and one of the reasons why I want to bring Rod on is because it's so, it is so misunderstood and it is so often automatically filled with with guilt and then people don't just don't know how to deal with it but there really is help for you so we do want to encourage everyone to turn to the bible we'll deal with these subjects as we move on but also if um if if any of you are in either a uh, a relationship where you're experiencing um destructive anger on the part of someone else or you want to deal with these destructive tendencies yourself we want to encourage you to go get the help that you need there's no shame in that if you need somebody wiser more able than you don't wait reach out to somebody you trust a minister um or somebody you know um, a lot of businesses have resources like this find the help that you need is there anything else that that you'd like to share before we sign off I think we've well, covered a lot of ground. I'd, yeah, I'd love to just uh, quote a famous line from Aristotle, which, um, you know, Aristotle was interested in sort of the integration of many aspects of life, religion and ethics and all sorts of things. And in his classic book on ethics, he said, anyone can become angry. That is easy. But to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose and in the right way, this is not easy. And I, I hear that and think that's a that's a great summary. This is not a simple subject or a simplistic subject, but with God's help and the uh, the power of Scripture, I think we can move further down the road on it. Yeah, I, I have an an image of I maybe mean, I don't fully know what to call it, but we're talking a subject like this years ago. There was a coffee shop that I uh, frequented, and um, it was popular. Even though um, much of the ways that they were they would deal with customers, it, it was pretty dysfunctional. But its popularity survived regardless. Um, and their, the name of the, this famous Canadian coffee shop will remain nameless. And they've improved. They've really, really improved um, through the years. 
Um, but at this time, I was just noticing a lot of things that were just not done well, like cleaning the bathrooms at strange times and sending people of, of the office sex and to clean the other washroom when customers were there and, and it was things like, the, oh, my anger's coming out now. But that's not the point. <laughs> they had a, a um, one of the servers um, was always angry. At least that was my perception of, of this person. She was always angry. And just the way that she conducted herself, it's like she was irked, this constant irkedness. And then I can't remember, it was years ago, I can't remember what something that she said once, but I picked up, she was actually extremely intelligent. And she was trying to, to navigate a very dysfunctional system where they were not actually treating the customers properly. And er there were a lot of things that were going wrong. And I had the impression she saw it. And, and in, in that kind of environment, it's very difficult to speak up. And I, and I saw this person, I never got a chance to talk to them about it. And I saw she was probably on the brink of either making it or, 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 or breaking it in her life. She's the kind of person, and I've met others and you probably have too. They see what's wrong with the world. They don't know what to do or they won't do it and all they do is they just stay angry all the time and they'll spout their anger and their frustration and it saddens me so much that some of these people have the key to solutions to help people and I and we're not gonna be able to resolve it today but it'd be, wouldn't it be wonderful to write a book on keys to a uh, you know constructive expression of anger but that's a horrible subtitle but you, you know what yeah. I'm trying to say yeah yeah no very true yeah. No, it's got the potential for good and the potential for evil. And we want to make sure we distinguish well between the two. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I do want to thank you so much for doing this, um, spending time. And it's been great to, to be with an old friend like this and talk about a difficult subject. Um, uh, we talked before that if uh, anybody wants to contact uh, contact Rod, um, he prefers. And this just happened the same thing with my guest last week. So this won't necessarily be a trend there's other people out there that uh, will share their blogs and other things with you but uh, especially with this subject if you want to get in touch with rod you can email me at comments at uh, thinkingbiblically.org comments at thinkingbiblically.org and i will pass on uh, those to rod and so again thank you so much for doing this very glad to be with you, Alan, and bless all the those who watch this. I hope it's uh, a positive experience for them. Yeah, yes, indeed. And so I do want to encourage everyone, if this is an issue for you, don't give up. Um, God is the biggest help. And to know that God himself actually might be feeling some of the things that are, that are affecting you. And by starting by talking to him about it first, and what we'll... we'll we're probably going to get to that. You start reading the Psalms and you can see how much anger people like King David express themselves uh, to God. And that's the best place to, to start. He yeah. can take it and he could guide you as to these, some of these constructive things. Well, that's it for this edition of Thinking Biblically. Uh, please uh, make sure to subscribe, as I said, and click the notification bell. Feel free to leave your comments. Um, and um, Send me any questions or comments you have to me directly at comments at thinkingbiblically.org. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman for Thinking Biblically.